Like send them forth to preach and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. And Simon he surnamed Peter. And James the son of Zebedee and John the brother of James. And he surnamed them Boanerges, which is the sons of thunder. Welcome to Bible Minute. I want to talk about the rapture today. I want to come from a different perspective. I want to look at the rapture. Everyone says, oh, the rapture could happen in any minute. I want to look at that, this pre-trib rapture. I want to look at it from a perspective that most people don't. They, they, first thing they want to do is dive in and prove these people wrong and these people were possessed and just all of this. But let's, let's look at something differently just, just to analyze what they, they say. Um, the first recording of the pre-trib rapture, as far as I could take it back, goes to Margaret MacDonald and uh, John Nelson Darby, who says he came up with it before Margaret MacDonald. Um, but I'm going to use her first. Uh, because a lot of people say, well, her, she was a 15-year-old girl. She was involved in the uh, Catholic Apostolic Church of Scotland. The pastor or father at the time was Edward Irving. Um, and he started running things differently. He didn't quite have all the beliefs. But anyway... She was sick, and they were taking her to the church because the church was starting to do the gifts of God thing where it, it was called chaos. In fact, later on, Mr. Irwin got kicked out of the church, the Catholic church. Um, he got kicked out of the church because there was no order. The way they would read some Bible verses and then people with these so-called gifts would uh, take over and uh, she was sick and I guess they were wanting her to be healed or something or she wasn't feeling good or something but anyway she was really supposedly sick and then she went into this trance and she started uh, spouting out or saying this uh, vision so to speak or this word from God and uh, a lot of people say, yeah, she said the, about the pre-trib rapture. And what's funny is when I do all this investigation, it doesn't come up that way at all. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm going to read a little bit of her vision so that you understand. Um, Margaret MacDonald's vision. And I'm just going to read points because it's long. It goes on long. But the most part is... is this is the part that people say is the pre-trib rapture stuff. Um, it says, "'Tis Christ in us that will lift us up. He is the light. Tis only those that are alive in him that will be caught up to meet him in the air. Now shall it be known what it is for man to be glorified. Now is the kingdom of heaven like unto the ten virgins who went forth to meet the bridegroom, five wise and five foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, but took no oil with them. But they that were wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But ye, I'm sorry, but be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess but be filled with the spirit this was the oil the wise virgin took in their vessels this is the light to be kept burning the light of god that we may discern that which cometh not with observation to the natural eye only to those who have the light of god within them will see the sign of his appearance now that's the pre-trib rapture part stuff where they say they'll be lifted up and all that. And it says that. But here's what's interesting. When they did a, there was, it, it, her thing was published. They left out some stuff. And they 
1861, they went back and reprinted it with the right stuff. And then there was a guy, uh, I think his name was McPherson. Um, he went back and he did the, the Margaret MacDonald uh, vision cover-up. But anyway, I want to read you the, the other part, which is really, really weird. That was left out. So, Margaret MacDonald says, I saw the people of God in an awfully dangerous situation, surrounded by the nets and entanglements about to be tried, and many without to be deceived and fall. Now will the wicked be revealed with all power and signs and lying wonders, so that if it were possible, the very elect will be deceived. This is the fiery trial which is to try us. It will be for purging and purifying of all the real members of the body of Christ. But oh, it will be a fiery trial. Every soul will be shaken to the very center. The enemy will try to shake in everything we have believed, but the trial of real faith will be found to honor, praise, and glory. Huh. They kind of left that out. So, what she says um, from this different perspective, from her word, is that you can either take it as there's two raptures. A lot of people say that there are. There's one at the beginning, and then those people go through the tribulation, and there's another one. But I find it funny that the real... Uh, read the exact quote. It will be for purging and purifying the real members of the body. The real. So who gets taken out? The unreal? The semi-so-called believers? I mean, you're... Okay, but I'm just saying. Okay. But anyway, go on down. And it talks about some other stuff. And that God's people will never receive his wrath. But I find this very funny. Towards the bottom of her, her little statement, it says... The trial of the church is from the Antichrist. See, it's not from God. But anyway. So that happened. She gave that in uh, Edward Irving's church. His uh, Catholic church. Um, he was involved with this. Because later, when he got kicked out of his church, he got with John Nelson Darby. Uh, which is the other person that they bring up. Now, what's really weird is John Nelson Darby says that he came up with this prior to the, the, the pre-trib rapture, prior to the 1830s when it got published and Margaret, uh, Margaret MacDonald did her little spiel and had her little vision. So, I'm, I'm trying to paraphrase this because I have... Tons and tons of papers on this and everything. And I, I, I'm just reading it out and studying it, trying to understand it so I can break it down for you as easily as possible. Anyway, so they he got kicked out. And this guy, uh, John Nelson Darby, who was actually known as the father of dispensationalism, not actually the father of the pre-trib rapture, which is weird to me that I find that interesting anyway if you don't know uh dispensationalism is where they believe which i don't i have a hard time with believing this that god would set it up and man messed it up and because man messed it up god had to go a different direction and then because man messed that up he had to try something else i don't think that god would ever do that and then the other way of looking at it is you have the baby version the infant version the adolescent virgin and the old man version of how it goes through the Bible. Which I don't buy that either. That's That just doesn't go with he was the same yesterday, today, and forever. But anyway, we're not on that. I'm just trying to do it from their perspective. And then we'll use common sense at the end. So this John Nelson Darby guy um, teamed up with um, Mr. Irwin. And they, they came up with the Plymouth Brethren. And that actually is a cult. 
and they came up with two sects of them. Um, they have the open and the exclusive, or the Irwinites and the Darbinists, I guess they call themselves. Yeah, Darbyists, but they never ever call themselves that. They always want to just be called the Brethren. Um, so, yeah. So, the exclusive Brethren were attached to uh, John Nelson Darby. And what's weird is today, supposedly, uh, when I looked it up, there's 46,000 members worldwide known as Darbyists or the, the exclusive Brethren. And the way they believe is kind of weird um it says their movement believes in infant baptism uh, like i said i'm not i'm not gonna prove it wrong or try anything i'm just gonna let their things um they uh they believe that there's going to be one rapture it is pre-trib and it, this Hold on to your socks, because here's what they say. The brethren, exclusive brethren, believe that there's a pre-trib rapture where the saints of God, the 46,000 brethren, are raptured, and the 7 or 8 billion people, whatever's on the planet currently, will be destroyed. So if you're not a member of the brethren, you're out. Okay, so that's really wild. Now, the open brethren <laughs> they are from Edward Irwin and he began to teach the idea of a two phase return of Christ the first phase being a secret rapture prior to the rise of the Antichrist he actually got with a guy by the name of um, Edward Miller to help describe it to people and um he described the teaching as this and I like the way he describes it because it puts it into common sense he says first there is the first fruits of the harvest he says your wise virgins because he's going back remember Margaret's vision was in his church so he kind of kept to that and he kind of expanded on the her saying there was going to be like two raptures but when you read it it to me, it only reads as one rapture and that you have to be Holy Ghost filled and all that stuff. Now, if you read it as the pre trib rapture and, oh, you have to be full of it and everything, then I, I, what I mean by full of it is full of the Holy Ghost and walking with God and be right there exhibiting gifts and everything. Otherwise, you aren't going to go to heaven until after the tribulation. But we'll get to that. Anyway, he believes that that happens. The, the first fruits of the harvest are the people, the wise people, the, like I said. Then, those are the people that follow him wherever he goeth. Then the abundant harvest is gathered afterwards by God. And then lastly, the assembly of the wicked for their punishment. So they're pretty much all real close to the same. Now here's the neat part. That was never really pushed by any of the early I'm going to call them church fathers or the people that, that the 1611 people or anything like that that didn't happen until like I said 1830-ish around there and it never really caught fire until around the, the, the beginning of the 19th century so it, it, it took a little while to take off um, there was a Bible conference in 1878 with the Nigeria Bible Conference is what it was called, 1878. And uh, it was a conference where it was originally pitched. And it, there was a, a lot of stuff like that where there, it sort of gained a little bit of acceptance, but it never went on. And then it just slipped. Year after year, they kept going to the co conferences. Well... It finally got accepted by the Presbyterian, the Baptists, the c other congregational members. And what threw it over the top was William E. Blackstone wrote a book called Jesus is Coming. And he wrote it in actually 1878. So he wrote that book right, during, right after that conference. 
He sold more than 1.3 million copies. Now, here's what's neat. The Schofield Reference Bible was published in 1909 and in 1919 and revised in 1967. Now, here's the neat part. He was a, the, the Schofield guy, he was like right there with Darby and all them. And he, he, he really run with that idea. And when these other people that I'm going to mention got a hold of that Bible, they ran with it even farther. And that's where I think it went today. But I'm just going to sum this up. You'll get it. During the 1970s, belief in the rapture became popular in wider circles, partly because of Hal Lindsey's book, The Late Great Planet Earth. He sold 15 million and 35 million copies. Um, he sold 15 million worldwide, I think it was, and 35 million in the U.S. or something. Anyway, it was a lot more. And it said uh, there was a movie, A Thief in the Night, uh, that was also involved in that. It said Lindsay proclaimed that the rapture was imminent based on the world conditions at the time. Okay, in 1995, the doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture was further popularized by Tim LaHaye's Left Behind series books, which sold close to 80 million copies in the U.S. and more worldwide. But anyway, so there are those copies and everything that's out there. Now, let's go back to what these people said and use some common sense here. And this is where, to me, it gets kind of strange. So if the elect are the people that are raptured and the very elect are the people that go through the tribulation, I said to myself, okay, well, what exactly is a tribulation saint? So I looked it up. Just to see what it would say they said they are. And it said right here. According to uh, gotquestions.org. The. Uh, something. I can barely read that. Generate article. Anyway I'll just go on. Because I'm taking too much time. Anyway what are the tribulation saints? Answer. The tribulation saints are quite simply the saints living through. And during the tribulation, we believe that the church will be raptured before the tribulation. Okay. That's what most people believe. But the Bible indicates that a great number of people during the tribulation will place their faith in Jesus. Um, in this version... Oh, I'm sorry. In this vision of heaven, John sees a vast number of these tribulation saints. I think he calls them a great multitude. Um, who have been martyred by the Antichrist. There before me was a great multitude, there we go, and that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding a palm branches in their hands. When John asks who they are, he is told these are who have come out of the great tribulation, and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The tribulation will be a time of great trouble for the wicked because of God's judgments. See, now I think they got that wrong. Um, it is Satan who's pouring out his wrath on the people to pure. But anyway, let's, let's, I'm not going to go there just yet. Anyway, talks about the Antichrist. Um, here, here's what I wanted to read. The tribulation saints will hear the gospel from several possible sources. Okay, so basically, this is this is where I want you to use your common sense. Basically, the rapture happens, and all the saints of God are taken away. So the spirit of God's taken away. All the saints of God are taken away, and they're in heaven, they having their uh, marriage supper of the Lamb for their seven years, as they say. Okay. The tribulation saints, those are the people left over will hear the gospel from several possible sources. The first is the Bible. There will be many copies of the Bible left in the world, and when God's judgment begin to fall, many people will likely react and find a Bible to see 
if the prophecies are being fulfilled. Many of the tribulation saints will also have heard the gospel from the two witnesses in Revelation 11, 1 through 13. The Bible says these two individuals will prophesy for 1,260 days, three and a half years, verse 3, and perform great miracles. And then there are the 144 Jewish missionaries who are redeemed and sealed by God during the tribulation. Immediately following the description of their sealing, in Revelation 7, we read the multitudes of tribulation saints who are saved from every corner of the world. Multitude. Okay, so they're saying that some people will be raptured out. The tribulation saints will serve their Lord Jesus Christ in the midst of desperate surroundings. They'll be faithful and true to the end. Many of these believers will die for their faith. But in their death, they will overcome. They overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. This is what this article says. Um, Revelations 12, 11. And God will reward them. He who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will lead them to springs of living waters, and God will wipe away every tear in their eyes. We praise the Lord that the great day of trouble will also be a great day of grace. Even as God's mel melting out his punishment on the unbelieving world, he will restore Israel to faith and extending grace to all who believe both Jew and Gentile. God has always been in the business of saving people, and the salvation will be available during the tribulation. Don't wait until then, however. Receive Jesus now. Okay, now here's where I have to come in with the common sense. So I'm thinking about this, and I'm like, okay, I've read these visions. I've seen where these people go. I see what people say the tribulation saints are. And people just come up to me and say, yep, that's it. We're not going to suffer God's wrath. I totally agree with you. The wrath of God is not the tribulation or the great tribulation, however you want to call it. The wrath of God is the wrath of God. It even calls it the wrath of God. Huh, imagine that. But anyway, most pre-trib rapture people separate the rapture and the second coming is two separate events. So they say the rapture happens, and then when he comes again, he'll lift up the saints. Okay. Every time I read about the rapture, even though that word's not really used in the Bible, I always read about and those who are alive and remain. Why would you need to be alive and remaining if that's the rapture? See, they're leaving something out there. That, that sentence right there has always gotten me. So, and those who alive and remain. Oh, that's when, okay, you see, they're talking about the tribulation. Yeah, okay, never mind. That's just my view. But anyway, going back to this, common sense. Okay, so this is my common sense. If anybody has ever witnessed, gone around and just witnessed the people, they know that people will slam the door in their face. They don't want to hear. Nothing's going right. Nothing or whatever. What makes you think that when the chips are down, as they say, and the Spirit of God has been lifted from this, and every Christian has gone, that these people, now, not just a few, but a great multitude, will pick up the Bibles, read and believe, and then be faithful to Christ until then. Till the end. Till they get killed. Or the rapture happens. If they don't believe now, and, and well, why should they believe then? And or, it actually says that when a lot of this is happening, because their fate will be sealed, people will be cursing God and doing stuff. It's It's crazy. I, I don't believe people have this around because some people who have actually read their Bible say, well, I'll wait till then to believe. I got a second chance. I could see it happen, know that there really is a God, pick up a Bible, and then go from there and be saved. And I'll be A-OK. -okay. 
And actually, people have said that to me. And I'm like, what do you say to those people? What do you say? No, you can't wait. God may kill you tomorrow. If, well, if he's going to get an exception for those people, and they're going to get a second chance, then why aren't the people that died going to get a second chance? Because when you die, it's sealed. It's over. You only get one chance. Wait a minute. If you only get one chance and you're living through it and you see it, is that your one chance? And what about the people that don't? I mean, it just can go crazy places with that. Plus, like I said, does it make it? And then here's the biggest argument I have. This is the absolute biggest argument. What makes you so special? Have you ever read the Fox's Book of Martyrs? What about the people that were put in the... in the? Uh, just think of it this way. What about the people that were put in the arenas and killed by lions and bears just for the, the, the sake of it because they were Christians? What if people... What if there were some people there that weren't really good Christians and they said, Well, I'm not a believer. I'm not, I don't believe in Christ. And then they get mauled by the bear or eaten by the lion. Imagine that. They're confessing that they never knew Jesus and then they step off into eternity. Whoa, you deny me, I'll deny you. That's not a good place to be. But still, let's just, that even, let's go this way. You're a Christian and I'm a Christian. What suffering have we actually done? I mean, really, if we're not going to suffer God's wrath and the tribulation is God's wrath, why is God going to make the elect saints go through the tribulational wrath? Does that even make a common sense to you? I mean, think about that. Oh, I'm special because I read my Bible a little bit and I went to church and I get evacuated out early or I get to leave early or it could happen in any second. It's a secret and I get to go float off. And I get to go have a big supper. And while I'm eating my dinner, I get to watch you suffer and die for Christ. And then you get to come up and be with me. That doesn't make any sense to me. If you think of it in common sense, how it's presented and who's presented it. I mean, where is this going to go? How is this going to come out? Anyway. I just want to give a different perspective. I want to use the Bible, and I wanted to prove these people wrong, but I wanted to just look at it from even if these people were right, what they're saying, does it really make sense? And if it does, I mean, John Darby, like he said, only his people, the brethren, will be raptured. And everybody else gets killed. The other guy says, oh, there's going to be two raptures. You know, and then you have to be a believer to be out. So if you're an open brethren and you're raptured and you're not a brethren after the rapture you still won't go to heaven it's crazy I mean if you look at the Plymouth brethren and look into them how bad of a cult they are I mean you'll be blown away and yet we're using this as our this is where the rapture came from and the other one I get oh but Mark you're not studied you don't know you don't have a clue man I'll tell you what, I'm glad I haven't had this malarkey pounded into me. It doesn't make any sense. And when I read the Bible, it says that this will happen certain ways. Anyway, just think about that. Think about what it says, how it says it. Think about the history, how they presented the history. I went to multiple sources. This one, you can ask people. I have pages after pages. My wife said... Do this video, get it over with. You're researching this for crazy. I've been researching this for two and a half weeks and reading this. And it, it just, it it's more confusing now that I know everything that they've said and where they've done and where they come from than it was before when I was just told, well, this guy came here and he had a, she had a vision and this is where it all came from. And this was from God and all this. And it's like, really? I don't buy it. Anyway. I've rambled long enough. This is Mark. I hope this has helped you. Do some research, people. And you'll see what you are actually presented with doesn't make sense. And doesn't line up with scriptures. 
Because if we're to believe John Nelson Darby was it, then if we ain't a Plymouth Brethren or a Brethren, we're doomed. Either open or exclusive, we're doomed. Okay? And even if the pre-trib rapture was a spinoff of that, and what it is, it still doesn't make sense. Because I'm special. I got to read my Bible and go to church, and I get to leave early. And you will have to suffer through it. That's... Anyway, enough. I hope this has helped you. Like I said, read your Bible. Read your King James Bible. You'll it you'll be surprised how it open up to you. And anyway, we have rambled long enough. I'm Mark.